Okay, thank you, Sophie. Um, I don't want to spend too much time talking to myself, and kudos to everybody here who has stood up for 20 minutes and talked without referring to their notes. I probably will not be able to do the same. Um, but to give you a little bit of background, I've been working at MCIS for the last six years or so, and throughout my time at MCIS, I've had the opportunity to uh, get involved in a lot of exciting projects related to language access and social impact. And this has given me a chance to talk directly to people who receive and benefit from language services. And doing this is something that makes me excited to show up for work every day. So my hope for this presentation is maybe that I'll give you a new angle to look at the work you do, um, or maybe ignite or re sorry, reignite or renew some passion in it, as I know how easy it is to lose sight of the end goal of our work when we're all caught up in talking about margins and revenue and deadlines and clients and translators. Um, so to get into what I want to talk about today, um, let's flash back to the early months of 2020 and the early days of what would soon be declared a global pandemic. There was so much information coming out about how to stop the spread of the virus, and the information changed just about as quickly as it came out. So even if you were a native speaker of the language that this information was being produced in, it could be really hard to keep up. Now imagine if you didn't speak the language. You could be relying on Google Translate, um, like Sophie showed us yesterday, that's not 100% accurate. Um, you could be relying on other people for information, which is just like a big game of broken telephone. Or you could be relying on unofficial sources of information that could have very well been misinformation. So imagine how isolating and frustrating that time could have been if you didn't speak the language. And on top of that, stopping the spread of the virus was contingent upon people actually following the guidelines. Now, if you couldn't understand the guidelines, you couldn't follow them. And if you weren't able to follow the guidelines, you were unknowingly putting both yourself and other members of the community at risk. So thankfully, governments, public health units, all sorts of organizations and institutions did recognize the need for language access at this point in time, and we saw a huge boom in the language services industry, both in translation and interpretation. So as much as I hate to bring up the pandemic over and over again, um, I guess the one good thing you could say about it is that it did highlight the need for language access. But language access goes beyond just crisis response. People every day all over the world face challenges accessing critical information and services, things like legal rights, government services, education, because of language barriers. So today I want to talk a little bit more about language access, um, the social impact of the work that we do, how and why you might want to track your social impact, and then at the end we'll delve into a few things you can do if you want to take action. So what exactly is language access? Um, um, so language access is the provision of language services and resources to ensure effective communication for individuals with limited proficiency in the language of the society they live in. The focus of language access is to break down linguistic barriers and promote inclusive societies where everyone has equal access to critical information, services, and opportunities. While language access certainly includes translation, it also includes interpretation, cultural mediation, and above all, just making sure that we're providing accessible information in a way that's going to be understood. So based on the International Organization for Migration's 2022 report on world migration, about 3.6% of the world's population, that's 281 million people, are living outside of their country of birth. And that number keeps increasing every year. So as you can imagine, the impact of language barriers is far-reaching. Language barriers can hinder people from fully participating in social, education, and economic spheres. They can impede access to healthcare, legal assistance, employment opportunities, and government services. When people aren't able to understand or express themselves, it can lead to miscommunication, misconfusion, and even jeopardize their safety and well-being. So to give you some examples, within a healthcare context, language barriers are shown to significantly impact a patient's ability to identify service, services needed, secure appointments, engage with healthcare professionals when seeking care, and manage post-appointment care and follow-up. Victims of domestic violence may be unable to communicate with the police, get medical care, learn about what resources are available to them within the community, or, obtain, or work with the legal system to obtain a protection order. Language barriers perpetuate inequalities and disproportionately affect marginalized communities. Immigrants, refugees, and indigenous populations also often face additional challenges due to language barriers, which exacerbate existing social and economic disparities. So it's crucial to recognize that language access is not just a matter of convenience or politeness, 
but rather of human rights and social justice. So how do we address these language barriers? First and foremost, we must strive for effective, sustainable language access solutions. And this is where we play a role as professional translation, interpretation, and other language-related services are an absolutely critical part of ensuring language access. And as LSPs, we carefully select and vet our language professionals to make sure that they have the skills and competencies necessary to provide accurate and culturally appropriate translations. Obviously, this is important because we want to keep our clients happy. Um, but it's also crucial to recognize that this helps us accomplish the end goal of making sure our end users are able to access information or services. So, of course, not every project is going to provide access to critical information or to critical services, but I think it's really important to highlight how the work that we do does have a social impact. And speaking from experience, I know it's really easy to lose sight of this. Every day I hear my project managers being like, oh, this client just sent back this document that they had reviewed internally. They just printed out the translation, wrote the revisions on it, and sent us the scanned copies back. Or they'll be like, oh, a lawyer just sent an urgent request for a document that needs to be translated from some rare language. Because they know they're going to spend all day trying to find a translator for that project. But when we stop to think about it, we realize that these community, community reviewers are not professional revisers. They don't have access to the keyboards that they need to make the changes in the document. And they just want to make sure that their target audience is going to understand those documents. And that lawyer that's putting you in a rush, he's just trying to make sure he can get these documents in for time for his client's refugee hearing. So that's when we remember why we do what we're doing. And we work hard to make sure that we can get it done. The work that we do uh, bridges communication gaps by enabling effective communication between people who speak different languages. It breaks down barriers and facilitates dialogue, allowing for exchange of ideas, knowledge, and experience. By enabling meaningful interaction, translation contributes to cultural exchange, mutual understanding, and the building of connections between diverse communities. It enhances access to information by ensuring that this information, resources, and knowledge are available to a diverse audience. By translating documents, educational materials, legal texts, healthcare information, we're providing individuals with limited language proficiency access to vital services, participate in educational opportunities, understand their rights, and make informed decisions. It promotes equal access to information and helps prevent exclusion based on language barriers. And translation serves as a tool for empowering marginalized communities, including immigrants, refugees, and indigenous populations. It allows them to communicate their needs, aspirations, and challenges effectively. And by making information available in their native languages, translation helps these communities assert their rights, um, engage in social, uh, sorry, assert their rights, access services, engage in social, economic, and uh, political processes. Translation gives a voice to those who may otherwise be silenced or overlooked. And lastly, it drives social change and advocacy. It supports social change by making important messages, campaigns, and advocacy efforts available to diverse audiences. It helps raise awareness about social issues, human rights, environmental challenges, and other pressing concerns. It amplifies voices and facilitates dialogue, driving social movements and promoting positive societal transformation. So I hope everybody's feeling excited about working hard to break down language barriers and ensure language access. So let's talk about how you can use Plunet to track your social impact. But before we get into that, let's talk about why you might want to track it. So the first is just to get a sense of your organization's social impact. There we go. Um, so you can use it to get an idea of how many projects provide access to critical information versus projects that don't, um, how organizational sectors tie into the criticality of information, and more. And you might want to use this information to drum up some employee engagement and weave social purpose into their everyday work. Another is to inform the decision-making process. Maybe you have some social impact initiatives in place and you need to um, assess their effectiveness, identify areas of, of improvement, and allocate appropriate resources. Or maybe you don't have any social impact initiatives in place and you want to get some started when you get home. Um, so you may also want to track your social impact to um, demonstrate value and attract funding, partnerships, support, and support from donors, investors, and other stakeholders who would like to invest in organizations that can demonstrate the value they create for the communities that they serve. 
And lastly, you might need to track your social impact to fulfill reporting requirements. So let's say you are able to secure some government funding for social impact initiatives. You can use Pluna to track the uh, effectiveness of these initiatives and provide it to the funder. So now I'll get into a few things we've done at MCIS to track social impact within Plunet, and these are things that you could easily implement on your own as well. So the first is with customer level properties. Um, so, uh, and we've defined a number of different uh, customer types like you see up here, this is a lot. Um, so every customer that we enter, to, enter into Plunet gets assigned a customer type or types if they have multiple. Um, and this gives us a sense of what types of customers we're working with, of course, um, but also when combined with crack, tracking critical information and services, which I will get into shortly, um, it helps us compare the criticality of the information with the customer sector to determine in which sectors we're making the most impact. Another feature that we use to track social impact are, well, two features, I guess. Um, company, sorry, this is an example of uh, the customer types that we have up and then the programs that I'm gonna talk about now. So we also use program and company codes. So we have our usual um, fee for service. Um, so when we have customers, and fee for service would be customers that pay for the service, like m most customers, um, they get assigned an FFS company code and their projects would go under the fee for service program. Um, so, we have other customers who might not pay for the service and they get their projects funded by other initiatives, whether that's government funding or our own funding. Um, so this helps us separate those and the company codes, uh, sorry, and the, pro the programs, the projects for those also go under the, um, the property for the programs. Um, so one thing about the company codes is that it forces resources to invoice for projects for different company codes separately so we can make sure that we're paying them through the correct fund. Um, and it also helps us track our conversion of funded customers to fee-for-service customers to assess the um, effectiveness of our advocacy efforts. Um, and the program codes we use to track spending um, and pull reports. So if we need to provide that back to the funder, or to track spending on our own fund um, and determine what funding we want to allocate for the, for the following year. Another group of properties that we've added for projects are fields to define whether a project provides in access to critical information, critical services, or both. And then we can define the nature of the assignment and the type of impact it has, whether that's on an individual, a family, or a community. So I have some examples here of projects that we have in Plunet. So, for example, this first one up here, that's likely a letter from a children's aid society to a family related to child welfare, and the impact on, would be on the individual, the child. Um, or this one here on the bottom. Uh, this one could have been election-related information, and that translation provided critical information and service to an entire community. So, this is probably my favorite tool we have to track social impact because it forces project managers to stop for a second and think about the social impact of the project that they're doing. Um, and it weaves this whole idea of social purpose into their daily work. And of course, we pull reports on this information to determine what kind of critical access we're able to provide through projects and, what, uh, and who is being impacted by the final product. And last but... Ooh. Okay. <laughs> Um, last but not least, we use tasks and order descriptions to track more detailed information. So, for example, when people apply for our free or subsidized services, we store information about the application in the description so that it's easily accessible for anyone who's working on that project. And then we also use tasks to um, assign people to follow up with uh, recipients of free or subsidized translation and gather testimonials. Um, and then we record the testimonials in there. Obviously, we can't pull reports on the descriptions, but we use the tasks if we need to view a report on what, like, what follow-up needs to be done or what follow-up has been done, and we can see all the testimonials there. Okay, so I hope everybody's feeling a little bit fired up about how the work that you do makes a difference. Um, so if any of this resonated with you at all and you want to do more, I want to leave you with some things that you can do to create greater social impact and promote equitable language access for the limited language proficiency communities you serve. 
So the first thing that you can do is off either offer affordable or pro bono services to individuals and organizations who may not have the funds to pay for translation or other language related services. Um, so for example, at MCIS, we take a portion of our revenue each year and allocate it to the provision of free or subsidized translation services. Um, so we have an application process, individuals, organizations can apply for the free or subsidized translation. And then we have an approval committee who will review the application and determine whether we'll fully subsidize it or partially subsidize it. And we use this funding that we've allocated to pay resources like they would earn from any other job. Another option would be to run free translation clinics and participate in newcomer events um, where you can offer this free or subsidized translation. So for example, in the past, we've partnered with community organizations for free translation clinics where we bring in a bunch of project managers, a bunch of translators, and people from the community can come bring their documents. If they're short and simple, we'll have the translators work on them right on the spot. We'll print them off there and hand them back to the client. Obviously, that's the best case scenario. Sometimes documents can be a little bit longer. You might not have translators on site for that language. So we'll take a copy, we'll take the person's information down, and we'll get, get it to them at a later date when it's ready. Um, so these events are a good opportunity to have face-to-face -face contact with the people who get translation and use translation. Um, and it gives you a chance to get an understanding of the struggles that they face. And it's also a really fun event for translators. Our translators love these events because it gives them an opportunity to interact face-to-face -face with the people that they work for and also the translation teams that they interact with every day. Something else you can do as an organization is collaborate with community organizations uh, to understand they, their needs and the challenges that they face when it comes to language access. So these community organizations obviously have direct contact with limited language proficiency speakers in your community and can help assess their needs. This allows you to ensure that your services are in line with the community's needs, whether that's changing the way that you provide culturally appropriate translations or tailoring a service that makes sure that their needs are met. You can also partner with these community organizations to host events like the free clinics I just mentioned um, and to advocate for language access for these communities. And that brings me to my last point. Um, if language access is something that you feel passionate about, I encourage you to advocate for it. There's a few different ways that you can do this. And the first a simple one is just to raise awareness about language access and you can do this, and, sorry, and the impact of language barriers. And you can do this through social media campaigns, blog posts, um, webinars. Another thing is to promote professional standards and certification to ensure that language services are high quality and culturally appropriate. And advocating for professional development and training opportunities within the industry also helps enhance the overall language access ecosystem. And the last thing is to join existing advocacy coalitions or create your own. Um, so two that I know of that I can tell you about are Language Access Coalition of Canada and Global Coalition for Language Rights that MCIS is a part of. So these organizations are typically made up of LSPs, community organizations, professional associations, and more, and offer the opportunity for you to engage with policymakers, support language access legislation, and collaborate with other like-minded organizations. And of course, increase awareness of language access issues and what we can do to break down language barriers. As they say, there's strength in numbers, and by working together, we can amplify our impact, influence policies, and create more inclusive societies. So, in conclusion, language access is not just a matter of convenience or communication. It's a fundamental human right that empowers individuals, promotes inclusivity, and strengthens communities. By breaking down language barriers, we open doors to education, healthcare, legal support, employment, and social participation for everybody. Language access is a shared responsibility, and we have the unique opportunity to make a difference by breaking down these language barriers and ensuring that everyone has equal access to information, services, and opportunities. And together, we can build a more inclusive and equitable society where everyone has the right to thrive regardless of their linguistic background. So that's all I have. Thank you for your attention today, um, and I'm happy to answer any questions you might have. I also have my email up on the screen here in case you'd like to connect afterwards.